Hey guys, it's Mr. Kennedy back with a video and we're going to be talking about the kingdom of plants and the colonization to land. Now the first plants that it came around, you got to remember that three billion years or more on earth was spent with the terrestrial or the land surface being totally lifeless. So life evolved early on in the seas and the first photosynthetic organisms were aquatic green algae. All right. Now this green algae of course is protist right and protist are the present-day relatives to ancient plants from long ago now when we talk about the evolution of land plants about 500 million years ago land plants evolved and they had to have certain adaptations first of all they had to learn how to not dry out or have desiccation occur to their cells and they did this first of all by having a cuticle a cuticle is a is a waxy waterproof coating around the leaf of a plant that prevents the plant from drying out. Um, if you've ever seen a magnolia leaf, you can actually bend the magnolia leaf and see the cuticle. You, sometimes you can pull it off with your fingernail. Um, also, the plant had to learn how to exchange gases and eliminate loss of too much water, and they have pores underneath the bottom of the leaf called stomata. Now, these stomata, if you look on this diagram, are illustrated right down here. Now, on each side of a stomata, you have two cells. These cells are called guard cells. And these guard cells control the opening and closing of the stomata. So if there is a drought going on, the stomata will probably be closed, which is not good for the plant because actually what occurs with the stomata is it allows for oxygen to be released from the plant and allows for carbon dioxide to come into the plant. And carbon dioxide is vital for the plant during photosynthesis. Next thing that had to occur when plants moved to land is they had to figure out a way to move water up the plant. They did this through a process of xylem and phloem. Oftentimes what we do is xylem will move water and nutrients up. Phloem moves nutrients down, such as glucose. So the way I always remember it is if you had a picture I know this is a great picture, but if you had a picture of a flower and you did your ABCs, D, X, Y, Z, so on, you'd have P, Q, R, S, D, X, Y, and Z, right? Well, P is going to be from the top down. X is going to be up. So, phloem carries nutrients from the, from the chloroplast down, and xylem carries water from the roots up. The last thing you had was they had to figure out a way to reproduce on land and seeds were the one way that was the most effective and seeds were basically a protection of the embryo that gave them a storehouse of energy now when we look at plant diversity there's four major groups there's the bryophytes, the pteridiophytes, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms now they basically all came from ancestral protists when they colonized the land and first thing you had the bryophytes over here on the left the bryophytes are non-vascular they're going to be very low growing to the ground. That means they do not have xylem and phloem, so they need, they need to live in a watery environment. Then you've got your tracheophytes, which are the three over here on the right. The tracheophytes all had a, tra a, trache a tracheid cell, which is basically a xylem cell, which holds water and makes a tube where water can move up and down. And that allowed these plants to be vascular. Now, a pteridiophyte is like your seedless vascular plant. It's like a fern. You got your gymnosperms and your angiosperms. Your gymnosperms are your conifers, they have cones. Your angiosperms are your flowering plants, your, uh, your oak trees, your dogwood trees, your apple trees, your orange trees. Um, and we'll talk about these in a later video. Now, when we look at the life cycle, an animal and a plant life cycle have some of the similar stages, but they're quite different. In an animal, we start out with a diploid organism, and through meiosis, we go to a haploid organism which has half the genetic material of the adult. And from there we have the haploid of one organ organism and the haploid of another mate to create the zygote. And the zygote goes through mitosis to make the animal. You, we really don't have any multicellular haploid organisms around on Earth that are animals. Now, in the plants, a little bit different. You start out with that same diploid um, plant, which is called a sporophyte. It has double two n number. And it goes through meiosis and creates spores and goes through mitosis and it creates a haploid gametophyte. Now the difference, the big difference between animals and plants is here. We actually have gametophytes that can be multicellular. So a plant can spend a lot of its time either as a gametophyte 
or a sporophyte, and different plants spend different amounts of time. So that's the big differentiation. Now, of course, you can go from a gametophyte. Two gametophytes can have gametes and make a zygote and go back to the, the sporophyte form. An example would be like in ferns. You can see the fern up here in the right-hand corner. That's an example of a sporophyte form, probably the one you're most familiar with. The gametophyte form of a fern is down here at the bottom, uh, which is the archegonium and, and the anthridia. Um, but the, the plant can live like this. So that's the big difference in the life cycles. Um, and one thing I forgot to tell you, that's called the alternation of generations because they can go between a gametophyte and sporophyte. Now let's talk about the first land plants. They were the bryophytes. They're your mosses, your liverworts, which you picture over here on the right. And actually has diploid and haploid forms living together. Uh, they are non-vascular. That means they have no transportation system, no xylem to flow, they have no roots. So they have to live in a wet environment. But they can have swimming sperm since they're in a moist environment. So they have flagellated or flagellated sperm. Um, their life cycle is dominated by a haploid gametophyte. So their gametophyte is their dominant form. That's the one you see most of. And they create spores for reproduction. That's haploid cells form a gametophyte. Okay. These are all pictures of mosses and liverworts, so in case you don't know what they look like. And probably the most famous type of uh, bryophyte is the peat moss, and these are actually peat bogs, and they house a lot of uh, fossil fuels. They're, they're used as fossil fuels today. They're burned for their energy, kind of like coal and um, oil will be burned. Um, the first, then we go to the first vascular plants, these pteridiophyte ferns, these pteridiophytes um, are vascular, so they have xylem and phloem, they have roots and leaves. They have still have flagellated sperm, so they still have to they still live in a moist, wet environment. Their life cycle though is dominated by the sporophyte generation, not the gametophyte generation as earlier. And they have what we call a fragile independent gametophyte called a pro prothallus. And it's right here. This is the prothallus right here. This this structure right here. And they do use spores for reproduction as well. And these are your pteridiophytes. Those are your ferns. I mean, what we would look at and see as ferns. Now, I mentioned our alternational generation. Realize that a fern gametophyte um, is, is a small haploid plant. And it contains both male and females in the same plant. It's called a homeospory. And in this plant, if you look over here on the right, the archegonia is actually the egg part, the female part of the of the flower, and the anthridia is the sperm. So that, that archegonia makes eggs, and the anthridia makes sperm. Uh, and if we look at the alternation of generation of these, you can see up here, here is the, the fern, which is the sporophyte, okay? And down here, the gametophyte form is down here, is this gametophyte form, which is the haploid. Now, if we think about pteridiophytes from long, long ago, you know, 290 to 350 million years ago, as they died and they piled on top of each other, they actually are what are responsible for our coal and fossil fuels that we use today. All right, I hope that helps you a little bit, and I will talk to you soon.